Hello, my friends. Today is a very good day. And if you're familiar with this channel, you know exactly why it is a good day. It is because what car is usually right behind me. And today we are going to be talking all about, well, I'm going to take, take a brief little dive into the history of Aston Martin. And I'm going to tell you my five favorite things about the DB7. So let's do it. And perhaps you are not familiar with this channel. Well, we cover primarily car history. That's my cup of tea. All things cars, anything I get my little hands on. And if that is your cup of tea, then go ahead and press the subscribe button too. Look at this precious. Look at this the precious mechanic caught in the wild right there. Oh, darn it. Anyways, now naturally you know, let me fix that a little bit. Naturally you know I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Aston Martin because that's my thing. So let's go ahead and go back to 1913 when Lionel Martin and Robert Bamford, is it Robert? I'll check on that first name in a second. But Lionel Martin and Bamford joined together in 1913 and they are selling Singer motorcycles. And you might recognize the name Singer, that is also the Singer sewing machines. I was right, it was Robert. Anyways, so Martin and Bamford get together and they decide that they want to create their own vehicles. All right, and they name them Aston Martin. Now clearly Martin for the last name of Lionel Martin, but I feel like they really missed out on an opportunity of not including the last name Bamford because that's a pretty cool last name. And now Aston, where did that come from? Well, that came from a speed hill climb that Lionel Martin did very good during speed trials. And there's actually a monument to Aston Martin at the Aston Hill. All right, so like I said, I'm making this a lightning round. 1915 is when their first car comes off, rumbling off the production line. Unfortunately, that's right around the time that World War I is also having some rumblings. So. Anyways, so World War I starts and Lionel runs off to join the British Navy and Bamford runs off and joins the army. And then at the end of World War I, Bamford leaves. But there's about to be an exciting twist. So yes, Bamford did leave, but a gentleman named Count Louis Zabrowski jumped into the scene. The man had a lot of money. Whether or not he had a legitimate title, whether or not he was a legitimate count, we don't really know. But he was the man that also created the real Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Or I think it was just Chitty Bang Bang. His car was just Chitty Bang Bang. But anyways, now you, you know what I mean. This is a digression. And if you're familiar with this channel, you know I can't even help it sometimes. But I could do a whole video just on Count Louis Zabrowski. I'm not sure if I'm saying Zabrowski correct. But this guy, he ended up, he made a lot of his own cars. All right, he was one of the earlier bad boys of racing. And he died at the age of 29 in a car accident, in a racing accident at the um, Italian Grand Prix at Monza. So, whew. all right, let's get back on topic. Now, an ongoing theme, now, an ongoing thing that would be at Aston Martin, and also this would be with a couple, more than a few other automotive manufacturers, would be in and out of financial despair. All right, so 40 years later, after Count Zabrowski and Lionel Martin, Martin would have left a little after Zabrowski joined anyways, it traded hands. Aston Martin traded hands multiple times. There was a very rich lady named uh, Lady Charnwood that purchased the company for her son. Obviously, that didn't work out. But we're going to fast forward. The part I want to talk about, which is where the legendary David Brown comes onto the scene. So, let's do it. So, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty proud of myself. I got through that very fast, considering how much I can digress and how much I enjoy talking about history. So now we're talking about when David Brown comes onto the scene and we'll start talking about the DB series of Aston Martin cars. All right, now it's 1947 and David Brown, who is a gear and machine tools manufacturer. I'm sorry. Oh goodness. It is in, I'm in South Texas in the summertime guys. So this hair is gonna be crazy. Anyways, David Brown gears and 
machine tools manufacturer is just combing through the paper, you know, looking at the classified ads. He sees a ad for a luxury automotive manufacturing company, and he says, you know what? I think I'm going to buy it. And that was Aston Martin. That is how David Brown got his hands on Aston Martin. And now Aston Martin, they go to work in quick order. In 1950, they come out with the Le Mans prototype, the DV2. And this would really be the start of the well-known and the timeless DB series. And after the DB2 Le Mans prototype, we would see the DB2-4, the DB2-4 Mark II, and then the Mark III. And then we would see the Italian style DB4. And with the DB4, that's where they caught consumers' attention. Don't get me wrong, all of the, before the DB4, all the successors prior to the DB4, they caught attention in the racing scene. But the DB4 with its Italian styling that debuted in 1958, that's when consumers started paying attention. And it also was the first domino. It was the genesis to what we would see styling wise for the DB5. And yes, it would be that grand luxury tour, the DB5 that would become famous by being featured in the James Bond 007 Goldfinger flick, which you should really put that on your Netflix sometime. It's blast in the past, I'll tell you that much. Now, fun fact though, it was not the DB5 that was in the novel. In the novel, it actually featured the DB Mark II, but it was special effects expert John Steers. Yeah, John Steers, not Stearns. Somebody's jamming music. Anyways, it was special effects expert John Steers that talked. Okay, there was, <laughs> that's where I was. It was special effects expert John Steers who talked Aston Martin into featuring their DB5 prototype in the film, and I think it was a good idea. Okay, now I'm getting a little bit of off topic talking too much about the DB5, but that's okay. We're just like one away from talking about the DB7, which is where I'm trying to get to, okay? Now we would also see the DB6 come out, and then, unfortunately, and like, like I kind of already mentioned, this was a bit of a pattern, Aston Martin would find itself in financial woes yet again. And in 1987, Ford Motor Company would buy, what, 75% of Aston Martin, and then shortly after, they'd buy all of it. Fast forward seven years to 1994, we would finally see, this is where I've been trying to get to, we would see the DB7 come onto the scene. So, the DB7 debuts in 1994, and you can either, you get two widget options. You can either have the AJ6, what, 3.2 liter AJ6 supercharged inline six, or you can get the Aston Martin V12, 3.9 liter Aston Martin V12. You got options. Now, that inline six, very jaggy, and I'll get to that in a second. Finally, where I've been trying to get to, we're gonna talk about my five. Finally, we're getting to my five favorite things about the DB7. So, let's do it. And factoid number one, favorite factoid number one for me, is that DB is named after David Brown. Because you see, if that man hadn't made a bold, if that legend hadn't made a bold leap going into the car industry, I mean, sure, he did have manufacturing experience, but with hand tools and gears. Although, that just made me think of Andre Citroen. His background was gear manufacturing. He did a specific Chevron gear, which is also the which is also the emblem for Citroen. But I digress. So, favorite little fact number one is that DB is named for David Brown. And without him, we would have never had the classic DB David Brown series of cars from Aston Martin. Round of applause. Favorite fact number two about the DB7 is that it kind of started its life as a Jaguar. You see, it's based on the XJS platform. And that engine I mentioned, the AJ6 inline six, well, that was based off a Jaguar engine, all right? And much of the DB7 was configured heavily by Jaguar Resources. Favorite fact number three about the DB7 was the massive amount of talent 
that was behind the design team on this car. On the design team for the DB7 was Ian Callum and Keith Helfick. Callum, on his background, has the Jaguar F-Type and the Aston Martin Vanquish. Kind of a big deal. And Helfick participated in the design of the XJ220. And number four favorite little fact about the DB7 is that it was, at its time, one of the most produced Aston Martins. That is until the DB9 rolled off the production line in 2004. In total, Aston Martin produced 7,000 of the DB7s. My hair is just getting poofier and poofier. All right, it is South Texas. It is hot as the Dickens. Like, I don't know if you can see, I got a little sweat mustache, but keeps me young, whatever. Now, fact number five, and this kind of might be, you know, I like the weird little quirky facts. This might be one of my favorites, okay? And it's all about, now, this is not new. Here, I've already started talking and didn't even tell you my favorite fact. That's, I'm gonna introduce it this way, so I'm gonna keep going. Anyways, I already told you that this was heavily resourced by Jaguar, right? Now, also, it's not any kind of, it's not any novelty. It's not any kind of new thing that automotive manufacturers will dip in their parts bins and other people's parts bins too to create a car with a little more costly, all right? Bean counters, right? Now, that's where I'm going with it, all right? Fact number five, favorite little fact number five about the DB7 are these side mirrors. Let me tell you about them. It's nice because I did just mention Citroen. What was I talking about? Andre Citroen. And these, these side mirrors were borrowed Citroen. All right. Now that's not even where, that's not where it ends. Okay. This car, the DP7 wasn't the only car to borrow those side mirrors. All right. It actually, there is a stable of supercars that have borrowed that side mirror, all right? The Jaguar XJ220, which I guess that makes sense because there was the same, the Hellfit was on both design teams, right? And, and the Lotus Esprit, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Tell me, what is your favorite of the DB series, huh? What's your favorite James Bond film? And did you know that they actually used, it wasn't just, the DB5 and the DB series was not just the entire car that's ever been featured in James Bond. It's been like, there was a Volkswagen, there was a, what was the other funky one that we were talking about? Anyways, we covered this on the radio show. Don't remember off the top of my head. I swear these, one of these days, an extension cord is gonna get me. Um, what is your face in, what is your favorite Aston Martin? What do you see in the background of here that you think I should make a video on? I've made a video on a lot of them, frankly. I could do the TR series again. That's always fun. You know me, I'm always talking about first generation Mustangs. My next video is definitely going to be this old Willis Jeep because I love it, but um, anyways. Let me know. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little informal and kind of long-winded history trip. All right. And little factoid session about the DB7. If you're wondering where I am, well, let me show you. This is our family business. My dad started a mechanic shop 40 years ago. I was blessed to be a mechanic's daughter, which means I got born into the love of classic cars or any cars all cars, frankly. What a treat. If you like that, go ahead and press subscribe. I've been waiting for this Willis Jeep to come back into the shop so I can make a history video on it because it's awesome. It's freaking awesome. I covered the history of the Jeep on our radio show that's on 1440 Keys and uh, it's fabulous. Will, yeah, it's, yeah, okay. I don't need to go down that rabbit hole yet. And I have a uh, prior video of this 1938 Chevy Master Deluxe. Fabulous. Pretty sure I got a who is calling on a Sunday. I'll let it ring. And uh, yeah, so this is our little playground. It's pretty glorious. We have wonderful customers and um, it's a whole lot of fun. So if that's what your thing is, then 
I'll see you next time. Post a new video every Monday, unless something comes up. All right. Bye.